Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you to everyone that submitted questions towards my Q&A video, which I'm going to be answering today. So I've selected 15 questions from the comments of my previous video, and I'm going to be answering everything you guys want to know and whatever opinions you guys want from me. So <laughs> thank you for watching this video. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. It means the world to me when people tune in and, and watch my videos and, and leave comments and that kind of thing so thank you so much and let's get on with the questions so the first question has come from henrik monk and this person is asking monoskin seemed to be the new leader in rock music kind of replacing pop what do you think about this potential change now i'm all for this change because i personally i'm not the biggest fan of pop music I love rock, it's always been one of my favourite genres and I think it's nice to see a fresh young band come into the charts and kind of take the conversation somewhere else when it comes to music, mainstream music. So for instance we've seen Travis Barker who is the drummer from Blink-182 who were a, a successful band, quite a polarising band from the early 2000s and the late 90s and Travis Barker is now quite highly sought after he's being uh, requested to be worked with by a lot of artists in the charts because of bands like Monoskin who have come in and shown that rock music is good it sells and it's actually well crafted so he's in demand this guy so you've got people like Willow Smith and Halsey I mean these are artists that I wouldn't usually listen to but if there was to be music coming from them that was going in a slightly different direction like rock and it was produced by Travis Barker, I would absolutely like give it a shot. I'd give it a chance and I'd listen to it. So those are my thoughts on this sort of sway towards a little bit more rock music in general in the charts. I mean, in the UK, we have great rock artists and bands that have always been doing really well in our album charts, but they don't tend to kind of make an impact in our singles charts because they're more indie and they don't have so much of a fan base that will sort of buy their record to push it up to number one because the fans of those kind of bands don't tend to be desperate in that sense. So thank you for your question and let's move on. Next question is from Moonshine and the question is, I am an Italian in the UK and I have noticed in the past months that English music industry has been a bit cold towards Monoskin compared to other countries. I believe there is a fan base and yet they are not invited to shows like everywhere else. Only the essential has happened for them just because it was unavoidable. Charts, Brits, etc. I was wondering if you have any idea on this. It feels like they are trying to ignore them a little bit rather than fuel the interest and the hype. Thanks and keep up the good work. Cheers. And by the way, they will be at Reading and Leeds in the summer. That's pretty cool. So I'm not and really an expert on the English music industry in general. But I can say this, this person's fears may be true and may have backing to them because of the British music industry's attitude towards Eurovision. Monoskin will forever be tied to Eurovision in the UK. Now, to me, that's fabulous because Eurovision is something I'm passionate about and I think it's underrepresented here, it's not spoken about highly and it deserves more credit than it gets. But precisely what I'm saying is a problem because in the UK journalists and music critics laugh at the contest and it's got a kind of a bad smell about it here and of course if Monoskin are completely tied to Eurovision and they won it, they're always going to carry that around with them. And again, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. So in this case, you've got Monoskin. Yeah, they appear at the Brits. They've got a number five single in our charts. They've been doing really well. But again, they didn't win their Brit Award. It went to Bruno Mars. They didn't even get nominated for a Grammy Award. And I felt that was absolutely preposterous. I mean, they are an international band who have brought songs in a new language to charts that wouldn't necessarily have things in Italian in the charts. That should be commended, that should at least have a nomination for a Grammy, but we all know things like that are quite corrupt and that's why they're probably not pushing for things like that. They're not 
they don't have management that are concerned with kind of bribes and whatever is involved in those award ceremonies. You only have to search Monoskin's name and look at a UK tabloid and they'll bring up the drug scandal from Eurovision, which wasn't even a scandal, wasn't even a thing. And they'll still talk about it and they'll, they'll show a picture of Damiano as a boy versus now, like, oh, look what's happened to him. He was so innocent and now he's all covered in tattoos and oh, he, he's a rock star and it's like... Yeah, they need to find something else to write about because it's just absolute dry. It's just really embarrassing. But um, yeah, I think this person's comments are... They, they are backed by evidence, but you just have to kind of look at things on the positive side. We've got an, uh, an Italian group that went to the Brits and they presented an award. So, I mean, that's a start and that's a good thing. We can only hope for change and for betterness when it comes to UK and the music industry. So the next question is from RAJC, who is a very great YouTuber for Eurovision. So check out his channel if you haven't already. He's one of my favourite channels. And he's put together a couple of questions and I picked a couple of my favourite ones here. What is your opinion on jokey style entries at Eurovision? Mm. It's a tricky one because I feel jokey entries deserve a place at Eurovision. I think they bring something interesting, a bit of humour, a little bit of kitsch. I like that. But to tick a box, for me, it has to be a good song. It has to be creative and it has to have done something not monotone, not repetitive. It's got to be innovative. And if it just so happens to be a jokey song, that's fine by me, it doesn't matter. So we got things like Disco Tech by The Roop and On Fire by The Roop or some of my favourite songs from the contest because they played with ideas and they explored different musical ideas and that's great, that's what I want to see. Whilst other things like Uno by Little Big, even though it did really well, it was quite monotonous and it quite repetitive. And the thing that sold that song was obviously the dancing and not the actual backing track. It was about three chords, it didn't really do much. So to me, I personally quite like jokey style entries if they are as musically intelligent and as musically in good in quality as other songs that would win the contest. So that's kind of my opinion on that. And outside of Eurovision, what is your favourite non-language English language song? or singer slash band that performs primarily in another language. I've got a few, but right now I'm quite into an artist called Elitze, who's French, and she had a little bit of a hit in the year 2000 called Molalita. That's a great song. It's kind of reminiscent of old French songs, but it's got a techno sort of slowish beat and a really nice hook and a nice melody line. So check that song out if you haven't, it's, it's beautiful. So next question is from Luca P and he is asking, as you know, at the Brit Awards, Wolf Alice took the prize for British group and they were rewarded right from Maniskin and they hugged too. The question is, what do you think about a possible collaboration between them? I would absolutely love to see that collaboration. I think Ellie's voice and, and Damiano's voice would just blend so well together and it would sound amazing. I think also the thing with Wolf Alice, what's so great about them, is that they have their own unique sound, but inside that sound, they experiment with kind of shoegaze, but also ballads, really haunting music. And then they just go full out and do a really kind of shouty screamo song, but it all stays within their own unique sound. And I think that's so cool. And Monoskin could technically slot in quite well there, but super group, it would be massive. It would be about eight people. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. I think I'd like to hear a duet between the two singers and I'd like to hear a blend of the melodies and the rhythms of Monoskin with the production and the backing track and the, the sound effects and the synths of, of Wolf Alice. I think that would be a really interesting thing to listen to. Thanks for your question. Next question is from Andrea65 and they ask, what has always intrigued me to know from you, what is your favourite music and which artist, album, musical movement has been important and decisive for your musical formation? Great question. I could go on for hours and hours, but I've sort of put together a short list of artists that really in inspire me with my own music and artists that I constantly go back to to listen to. So one of them is Gilbo Sullivan. I love 
his music. He has some great tunes. One of my favourite is Houdini. If you haven't listened to that, check that one out. Joni Mitchell, of course, she's a legend. Just beautiful songwriting. Carol King as well. Love those artists. Jumping a little bit forward now. I quite like Gwen Stefani. I think she's an underrated artist. She has a very interesting style of singing and her voice is very hypnotic in my opinion. I think she's got some great songs there. What You're Waiting For is a fantastic boppy song and also Four in the Morning. So if you're into a more kind of 2000s sound but with a good voice and you like your Italian Americans and check out Gwen Stefani's music. Wolf Alice, of course, I've already mentioned them a few times, but they are a band you must listen to if you want to get into UK music that's currently in the charts right now. Um, and in terms of other artists, I'd say I always go back to kind of Morrissey and the Smiths. I think they're fabulous, just really great melancholy music, but with an upbeat tempo, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and I guess a wildcard one... Um, I haven't really talked about classical music. I'd say Clara Schumann's music. It's a little bit out there, but I think women in classical music are underrepresented and there's too many of their brothers stealing their music as their own, you know, it's not fair. So if you want to kind of stream people's music like female composers, Clara Schumann's a great one to check out. Thanks for your question. Next is from Hepolo and they ask, do you think there's a recent bias towards minor key Eurovision entries in a way that they are considered more serious by default? Absolutely, yes there is. I heard a podcast a couple of years ago that talked about how all of the most recent winning songs at Eurovision were in the minor key. And I think there's an argument to be made that yes, the minor key sometimes gives a song a little bit more somberness and a little bit more expression it doesn't kind of close off expression but if you think about for instance a song I recently reacted to Brividi that's in a major key and maybe some of you won't know that it's in a major key yet it's heart-wrenching and poetic and beautiful and the melody is soaring that's in a major key so I think there's good examples of songs in a major key that could win the contest and they're not cheesy and overboard and happy they're actually very contemplative. So yes, there is a, definitely a bias towards minor key songs. People kind of hear that, even if they don't know about major versus minor key, they'd listen to it and think, oh, it's sad. It's, oh, this sounds kind of more melancholic. Oh, therefore, you know, this should probably be a better song. There's something that sounds happier, you know? Maybe we're in a society right now that's just a little bit depressed and we kind of, lean and gravitate towards minor key songs. I don't know. Next question is from Cat Willem and they ask, do you think the UK does so badly at Eurovision because of the UK media's rubbish attitude towards the contest? If not, why do you think we do? I think we do do badly because of the UK media's attitude, but you've got to think about it. Okay, we do badly because we don't get points. You have to get points to do well at Eurovision and we don't get points because our song and staging are really bad right they're really outdated and crap and that is because the BBC doesn't get their act together every year and look at the competition and try and outdo it try and send something competitive and that is because of the media constantly making the attitude in general in the UK towards Eurovision totally and utterly sour and that is like you said because of the media it's literally it all comes full circle if the media changed their attitude it would change the palette of the UK audience and therefore the BBC will want to actually impress and do well and therefore the quality of the song goes up the staging quality goes up it's competitive bam suddenly we're not in the bottom five anymore I think there is a direct link and I think there are other factors as well that contribute to why we do quite badly and um, it's to do with the pool of artists available, definitely people that seriously wouldn't be seen dead at the contest because they think it's literal career suicide, but I mean look at Manaskin right now, just saying. Um, yeah, so very good question and yeah, I'll have a mull, I'll mull that over, especially when we get to find out the artist this year and especially as you know, the BBC unfollowed literally every single person apart from the BBC themselves on the Eurovision account, which is just embarrassing. Anyway, 
Next question, Just Hernia is asked, first of all, it's very nice to see your enthusiasm while you're trying to share with us your passion for music. So the question is, where are you from? I think you said you have origins from Malta. Can you tell us something about that? Of course. So as you can tell by my face, I am not 100% Maltese. I am in the UK right now and I do have kind of Irish Scottish ancestry as well as Maltese from my dad's side. So I'm kind of a bit of a mix. And, um, but I, I, I do have a lot of um, links to Malta. I, I tend to try and go there a lot to visit my family. And I try and make the food a lot at home. I try and learn the language and, and try and keep the language spoken in my house a little bit with my dad, just here and there, little words, you know, to, to keep my, my, um, my grandmother's memory alive. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a beautiful country if you've never been there. It's a really interesting blend in the language of Arabic and Italian and a little bit of French as well. And in terms of kind of DNA of the people from Malta, it's quite disputed where we're actually originally from. I think we've got links in general as a, as a society to kind of Sicily. But if you go back in time, we've they've been there's been so many sieges of the island, so many people conquering and colonising the island that you get... Um, kind of lots of DNA admixture. So I think they say a lot of people from Malta have maybe 10% or less DNA kind of coming from the Middle East. Um, but yeah, I'd love to kind of find out a bit more about my ancestry because I'm very proud of it. Uh, next question is from Manu. And this person is asking, my question is really simple. I simply never understand how the platinum, gold and silver certifications work for songs and albums since Wikipedia talks about some numbers like 600k for a platinum. But if we're talking about a single and comparing those numbers with listenings on Spotify, some songs should have so many certifications. So basically, when it comes down to um, songs, from my understanding, I might be wrong and correct me if I am wrong. From my understanding, they try and go through physical sales. So if you're literally buying this song, it will feed through as a certification on the charts and it will kind of boost that song up in the charts, especially if you're buying the album as well in the album charts. However, with things like Spotify, I think a lot of record companies and certifications and things like Billboard, they're a little bit reluctant to use things like Spotify as a benchmark for the charts because they firstly a lot of people don't actually pay for Spotify because they use the free version obviously and I think also with like YouTube counts as well people don't people are reluctant to take those fully in in processing where that song should be in the chart because they feel like firstly um, views on YouTube doesn't quite equal a sale of a song and also what happens is the songwriters who are on that track don't actually get much of a, a cut of the song. It's, it's something like 13p per pound. It's really poor. And especially if you're streaming a song, that artist will get like, I don't know, a tenth of a penny per stream, something really bad, which means the songwriters getting something really tiny and it's it's not quite fair in my opinion but if anyone knows a little bit more about chart certifications you just comment down below and, and answer the question a bit better than i did next question is from david lott um what is the best live performance i've seen and data on subscribers nationality and he's also asking what happened to the bad movie reaction series so firstly with the movie thing I've had to put it a little bit on hold. I really enjoy making those videos, but it's the copyright that gets in the way. It could literally, I could work for days on a video and then it never actually sees the light of day because of copyright claims and strikes. So I've kind of had to put that to the side. I might return to it at some point because it's just so fun to do, but it's like I'm wasting my time if it's never actually going to get uploaded. That's the thing. In terms of data on subscriber nationalities, well, you can probably guess my top country is definitely Italy, followed by Spain, USA, UK and Germany. So those are my kind of top demographic. So thank you to everyone who's tuning in from those countries. It means a lot to me. Um, and the best per live performance I've ever seen is probably I saw the organ symphony at the Royal Albert Hall. 
live a couple years ago. It was amazing, just so good. If, if you guys don't know the Organ Symphony, check it out. And next question is from Serbio in Barcelona. And the question is, do you have any musical background? I assume you studied music since your reactions are always backed up with great explanation. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, I have a degree in music and I've been studying music since I was a child. So quite a long time, actually, like 15 years now. Um, and yeah, I basically try and use my musical knowledge as best as I can in layman's terms in my reaction videos, because firstly, I like to kind of add something else to the song try and let people know why they might like or dislike a song because of certain musical reasons they might have not been able to put words to and if someone like me who knows a bit about music can kind of put some words to that it helps people and also I don't want to be capitalizing on someone else's hard work I, I don't monetize my videos I don't put ads on my videos that's the copyright holder who does that because I don't want to make money off other people's music. It's not fair. That money should be going to the songwriters and the people that recorded the songs, the, the instrumentalists and the musicians. That's just my opinion. Um, but thank you for your question. Jessuism wrote, what is your first memory of Eurovision Song Contest? Did you start watching it as a child? So I believe my first memory of Eurovision in general was Alexander Ryback, but I also sort of vaguely remember Scooch doing Flying the Flag and Daz Samson as well. It's quite clouded, but I think it is kind of the UK's really, really bad entries from the kind of mid to late 2000s. Um, but my proper kind of when I really, really started getting into Eurovision was around when Alexander Ryback came on stage with his wonderful violin. Next question is from Virginia Vorino, and they ask, which musical genre do you listen to the most? Any favourite? definitely rock music. I mean, you could tell by my channel, it's rock music, followed by classical music. I love classical music as well, particularly the romantic period of classical music. And the final question is from Andrea Regis. And will you come to Turin next May? I'm praying. I really, really, really want to come, but I'm afraid there's a high chance I might not be able to go now because of how costly it is and also obligations I have at work. I just don't know if I can do it. And I really want to go. I really, really want to go. And it's a shame because if the UK won, I'd just hop on the train and I'd be there, you know? It's easy, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. But if I'm not there, my heart will be there. <laughs> But anyway, thank you so much, guys, for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe as well if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys soon for more content because we've had four new songs, sort of four. We're waiting to hear what happens with Ukraine right now. That's why I haven't posted a reaction. So yeah, stay tuned and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.